This is the Accidental Safety Pro brought to you by Vivid Learning Systems, an HSI company. This is episode number 20. My name is Jill James, Vivid's Chief Safety Officer, and today I'm joined by Robert, who is Risk Manager with M3 Insurance, an insurance broker in Wisconsin. Welcome to the show, Robert. Thanks, Jill. I appreciate you having me. So, Robert, I, um, I would like to hear your story like everyone else does. How did you accidentally fall into safety? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'll start off real early in life. Um, started working on a farm when I was very young and, you know, did that until I got out of high school. Once I got out of high school, I got into construction. And so I was a, an electrician mm-hmm. at first, became a carpenter later and experienced some things that um, kind of led me towards safety. Hmm. Um, the first one as an electrician was um, my boss was trying to keep the power on for the company that we were working um, on one of the main panels. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it it didn't work out how we had planned it. Um, there was an arc blast, um, and I experienced, you know, the auditory issues and the visual issues for, uh, you know, a period after that arc blast. Um, and it was really something that struck me as, you know, I didn't realize how big of a deal it was until it happened. Yeah. Um, and something that I was amazed that I was not protected against, I guess, at that point. Still not really knowing much about safety. Um, hmm. You know, moving. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm curious to. I mean, I think let's let's unpack that one a little bit. So, at this point in your life, are you you're pretty young? I'm guessing. Yes, correct. And I'm 19 years old at that point. Yeah, right. And so you had likely never heard of what an arc blast is. No, and I I honestly didn't know what it was called until I got into safety. Right, exactly. So you had, (laughs) when I say unpack, let's unpack that piece just a little bit more. You had gotten into the construction trades as a as a teen. It sounds like. Mm -hmm. And then did you did you go to school to be an electrician, or is this one an apprenticeship program, or how did that work? So um, it was a non union apprenticeship. Um, So. You know, a lot of the companies I worked for early in construction were non-union, smaller outfits. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot less there for safety. Yeah, right. And so your 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 boss. Now this doesn't sound. Hmm. Let's see. How do we say this? This doesn't sound um, out of the ordinary to, for someone to not want to turn off power and work on live parts, right? Correct. Yep. It's it's not the correct choice, but sometimes it's what happens, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, even if you are going to work on live electricity, there's some things that you can do from a PPE perspective to protect yourselves. But I don't know that he was even aware of that, honestly. Right, right. right. Yeah. I've had the same, same uh, experience um, in my career with, with different trades as well, not fully understanding all of the risk associated with the job. And so um, just before we move on, in case someone who's listening isn't familiar with Arc Blast, do you want to explain what that is from your perspective now, the thing that you didn't know when you were 19? Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of like a lightning bolt. I I like to think of it that way, where Mm -hmm. um, energy is jumping from one place to another. And typically, um, this is on an electrical panel bus bar or on some of the wires connecting Um, And basically there's a gap and that electricity jumps, which creates light and heat. So it's, it's something that, you know, on a 120 volt, your, your house outlet, it's going to arc, but it may not be um, severe. And when we talk about, you know, we start getting up into the higher amperages and voltages, that's where, um, you know, I've even seen video of somebody getting vaporized um, Mm -hmm. essentially by that. So Mm -hmm. that's my, my take on it. Yeah, right. And so when the arc blast happened to you and you're 19 years old, were you standing in front of like a breaker panel? Correct. Yep. Yeah. And and so you said the the sound of the blast affected your hearing. Were you burned at all? I was not. So I was wearing leather gloves and um, my boss was smart enough at the time to have me turn away from the panel. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was not burned. Um, the gloves ha- were charred. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But that's, but that was really scary. Yeah. And I think it, it wasn't something that was immediately scary because of the reactions of the people around me. Um, it was 
it seemed like it was commonplace or it wasn't that big of a deal. Wow. Um, but of course, now I understand how serious it could have been. Right, exactly. So you experienced some some problems with your hearing. Did they have? Did it have lasting effects? It did not. Um, I haven't been tested, you know, with an audiogram or anything yeah. like that. But um, I don't have permanent yeah. tinnitus or anything like that. Yeah. Wow. What a lesson at 19 years of age. So not. Yeah. And, and I'm interested to hear like. Where did this take? Where did this take you next? And when did the safety lights start turning on? I'm I'm guessing maybe it took a little bit longer. It did. It took a few yeah. more, <laughs> a few yeah. more brushes with death. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> yeah. So after that, yeah, keep going. You were saying something about carpentry. Yeah, and and so after the electrical debacle, I'll call mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Um, started getting into carpentry. Um, you know, everything from stick framing to roofing, siding, windows, um, just kind of the whole gamut there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there was an incident where I slid um, off a roof. So we never wore fall protection on roofs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the, the residential roofs can be pretty steep. And um, yeah. it was one of those occasions where you slip, you catch yourself. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal at the time. But when you start thinking about what could have happened, um, it really, really sinks in. Right. right. Um, and that, you know, continued where, you know, we're not, we're not using guarding. We're not using PPE. That's just kind of that, you know, again, non-union small shop. The employer was not aware of safety regulations um, and things like that. There were even instances mm-hmm. where, you know, we do know about some things for safety. Um, fall protection, for example, I brought to his attention and and was not something that he wanted to purchase anything for. So it was Mm -hmm. kind of, you know, get up on the roof or find a new job. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's one of the attitudes that stood out to me as as a real problem as I got into safety. Yeah. Um, That's one of the biggest barriers. Yeah, it is. Uh, Agreed. And unfortunately, it it seems, I don't know, I guess I, I don't, I don't want to diss the construction trades because there are so many that are doing such a great job. Yep. Um, however, my experience, particularly with OSHA and, you know, keeping in mind that, uh, you know, I was, we were, we were targeting employers who were being more risky than others as well. So my, <laughs> my experience was with people primarily who had that kind of attitude, You know, like it was a cost center. It slowed work down. It was that safety stuff, you know, like insert any cliche you want makes work more dangerous because, you know, we, you know, I'm agile on my feet, you know, whatever cliche you want to insert. It sounds like you uh, experienced it all as a really young person working in the trades. Yeah. And I would say um, there's two angles there. So from the employer's perspective, there's you know, we, we got to get the job done, um, you know, just, just get up there and, and get to work. Um, but mm-hmm. there's also the attitude that um, I grew up with, and it may be a Wisconsin thing, it may be a construction thing, I'm not really sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, just that kind of like beat your chest, I can do it anyway, I don't, I don't need a harness, I can just get up there and do it. Mm-hmm. So there's, you know, the perspective from the employees just, you know, wanting to be hard and get things done, but there's also that employer side as well. Um, Mm -hmm. And when you combine those two, it just does not lead to safety. Yeah, right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yes. So where did you where did your road take you next? Yeah. So um, there's there was a a number of injuries um, with with different employers. I had a ecological restoration company, I'll call it, um, that I worked for. And we were doing some tree clearing and invasive species clearing, Mm -hmm. um, working at the bottom of a hill. Uh, someone rolled a log down the hill. Um, I was standing in front of the wood chipper, and yeah. uh, the log hit me in the back of the leg. Um, luckily, you know, I fell down to the ground rather than forward. Um, it was a pretty big log. So, you know, that was something that, um, you know, pushed me more towards evaluating what I was doing with my life. Um, Literally. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just continued to, to experience these things throughout my career of it just doesn't seem like that's the right way to do it. Um, you know, or I felt like the employer really didn't care about me. And that just kind of pushed me forward, I guess I would say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so then I had um, herniated discs um, that I'm not sure where they resulted from. I worked for an asphalt company 
And uh, we used to load, you know, 550 pound machines into the back of a truck without a lift gate and things like that. Um, had a, a pretty serious uh, pull in my back and went to the doctor. Um, and there were two herniated discs there. Mm. Um, there was a, a you know, mild effacement of the cord, um, not serious enough to do surgery. So, you know, recovered without surgery. And I, and I thank God for that. Um, mm -hmm. Surgery is never never the answer in my opinion unless it's an emergency surgery yeah. um which then led me to go back to work um definitely took a little bit more care um for my back in that scenario but yeah. you know all the walking i was doing for that um, asphalt company led my hip to have problems and part of it was a genetic problem where uh, the joint and the bone in the hip was formed a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And so there was some wear and tear. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, um, you know, I needed a resurfacing of my hip. Mm -hmm. um, so I had that re resurfacing surgery and kind of went through the, the process of recovery, which was a couple months. Um, and during that couple months, I was, you know, almost not, not I wouldn't say bedridden, but I was on the couch for, yeah. for the most part. And, you know, really started to think back on some of these things where, you know, I nearly got uh, blown up with an arc blast. I nearly got electrocuted. I nearly um, broke my leg with a log coming down the hill. The and wood started, chipper. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I started thinking, you know, where does this where does this lead? You know, mm -hmm. in two months when I get back on my feet, 100 percent, where am I going to be? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's what really made me evaluate going back to school. And mm -hmm. safety was still not on my mind at this point, <laughs> um, surprisingly, um, yeah. because I think, you know, it's not something that's talked about in school growing up in, in middle school, high school, those types of things. Yeah, you um, don't know it's an option. You don't. You don't. Mm -hmm. You really, unless you investigate it on your own, um, it's not something that's brought to your attention. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in investigating colleges in the area, investigating careers, and really trying to do a good job of forethought and planning, um, I actually ended up signing up to go back to school for um, environmental science. Mm -hmm. And so just something that I've always been an outdoorsman. I always liked the outside. Um, it made sense from I might like my job perspective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, uh, Other absolutely. than the paycheck. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And so I found that um, in starting to take the classes that it was maybe not exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. um, it was something that uh, maybe I needed to consider a little bit further. Um, and it was brought to my attention that they had a, a real strong safety program. This is at UW-Whitewater now. Mm -hmm. um, and I went in and talked to Dr. Todd Lucine, who you've had on the show before. We sure have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> great, great guy. I love that mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. Um and, and just kind of got a better idea of what, what is safety? What does it mean? Um, you know, really, at that point, elementary understanding, OSHA, you know. Right. Um, there's regulations that employers have to follow, and uh, employees need to be safe. They need to come, come back home the way they went in. Mm -hmm. um, and that really struck me to thinking back again on what had happened to me. And I thought, gee, you know, if I could make a difference in one person's life, you know, i.e. they don't have a, a back surgery or a hip surgery, they don't have back problems. Um, if I could just make one difference, I think that would, you know, be worth it. Yeah. yeah. And so I started down that path. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, it seems like, Robert, the, the universe, <laughs> if you believe in the universe giving you signals or nudges, the universe was pushing you so hard, <laughs> Absolutely. you know, I mean, like, like literally a blast, a fall, a surgery, uh, like a hard stop, lay on the couch. We need to do a reevaluation. You know, you're thinking back about what's happened to you up until this point of your, you know, young life Yep. and, and where are you going? Um, so Congratulations to you on listening to the universe finally though it took a, it took it took some uh, it took some um, really big emphasis it sounded like Yeah, I think the the next step would have been I wouldn't have made it. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Well, we're happy you're here. <laughs> so you're at UW Whitewater, you you just de you decide the, to make a shift from environmental science into safety? Yep. Mhm. Mm okay. Yep. And I think, you know, 
honestly, um, you know, the, the program there is excellent. Um, so the classes I was, was taking initially were really opening my eyes to things. Um, but it wasn't until I got more involved with the student safety organization and started spending some more time with Dr. Lusheen um, that I really started to see the opportunities open up. Mm-hmm. Um, like what would it mean as a job, you know, being able to see what that might look like? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, early on again, it was, okay, I'm, I'm going to be OSHA or I'm going to be, um, you know, a, a huge corporate, uh, a huge corporation needs a safety person for if OSHA is coming in or to make sure that they're up to compliance and things like that. And so real basic understanding of what it meant. Yeah. Um, and started... Yeah, I think that's where lots of us start out when we when we think about that. Not yeah. uncommon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so the exposure, I think, is what really pushed me to explore and get more involved in safety. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say if it wasn't for Dr. Lusheen at that point in my life, I probably would have, um, you know, gotten a degree and gotten a job in safety, and that would have been, you know, probably the extent of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I, I really got involved in organizations and, uh, mentoring and a lot of other things that really led me, you know, down the last part of my path to where I am today. Hmm. Um, you know, I was encouraged to, uh, explore, uh, uh, internships and not just one internship that's required for the, the program, but I took, um, I think three, three different internships before I accepted a position. So, I got, That's fantastic. Yeah, I got a lot of exposure, and I think mm-hmm. the the way I went about it was to go into manufacturing and safety. Mm-hmm. Um, so I worked with Oshkosh Defense, um, defense contractor here in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Um, I then worked for a construction company, uh, Hooper Corporation in Madison, Wisconsin, a mechanical contractor. Mm-hmm. And then my third internship was with M3. And so I kind of got that full exposure of, you know, general industry, construction, and then the insurance side of it, which I think is a bit of an emerging piece Mm -hmm. to safety. Mm -hmm. Um, So that, I think, you know, the exposure, again, I've heard a lot of people preach about it on on the show here, but you really have to take advantage of opportunities. You really have to go outside your comfort zone and get exposure to things to know if you like them or not. Exactly. And so those three internships, were they all paid? They were. They were. Um, so it allowed you it allowed you some flexibility to, uh, during that time to, to to check all of them out. And what a what a what a bright thing for you to do. You know, I've it probably took me, hmm, you know, at different places of my career, I would, you know, stop when I'm going to make a job change and ask myself, what do I really want? But I think it wasn't until about five years ago and I've been in the field 23 years. So you did this very early. Good for you. (laughs) Where I really took stock of, you know, looking across all the industry types and asking myself, which one do I really, which one do I really love? Which one really gets me, gets me excited to want to contribute to. And, you know, kind of had that conversation with myself for my next job. And you did that coming right out of school. (laughs) Nice work. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it was something that, um, you know, kind of, again, a a path that was laid in front of me, um, worked with Oshkosh Defense and, you know, frankly, that's a a world-class, um, safety program up there. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was great. And actually my boss who worked there, um, who hired me there went to Hooper Corporation and I followed him there. So, um, you know, it was one of those things where, the exposure was awesome. It led me down another path. Um, and, and ultimately led me here. Yeah. Right. And so what was it like when you did that internship in construction, assuming that corporation kind of had, had their safety stuff together? What was that like for you to see it being done well compared to what your early experience had been? Yeah, I, I would say, um, that even with, with Oshkosh defense, but particularly with the construction, um, the attitudes were completely different. So the mentality of we've got to get it done, um, just get up there and and start roofing. um, That was not the mentality there. Um, Mm -hmm. They truly cared about each other. Yeah. And um, it was it was eye opening to me that that 
there was a possibility that construction was that way. For a long time, I had in my brain, you know, rationalized that this is the construction attitude, get it done. Um, we don't really care about your personal mm -hmm. life. Um, and, and I think that really changed my perspective. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, like I said, there are people who are doing it well. There's companies that are doing it well. I'm happy that you had that experience. Yeah, it was, it was great. So M3, uh, insurance broker, tell us about what that's like from a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not, I'm not sure we've had anyone in the insurance industry on the show before. So set that stage for us. Tell us what it's, what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. So the difference, I think the important to, uh, to call out here is an insurance carrier actually writes the insurance, mm -hmm. um, the insurance broker. We're basically partnering companies with the right insurance carrier. Right. And so my role in loss control or risk management is a lot different than on the carrier side. Mm -hmm. Um, my day-to-day -day varies so much, um, and that's one of the things I love about my job. Um, you know, sometimes I'm answering a, a quick email question about when do I need to post, post my OSHA log. Mm -hmm. um, other times I'm doing training in front of, you know, 300 to 500 people. Mm -hmm. um, other days I'm just having a, um, a planning meeting based on losses. Here's what we project your... Um, mod factor to be over the next year. Um, and here's where I think you should focus your efforts. Here's a few things I think you could do. So really it's a consulting role. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the, the flexibility to, um, you know, not be under a safety budget at a company, not be, you know, housed inappropriately in the corporate structure of a company. Um, I don't have those challenges that a lot of people in safety have, mm -hmm. um, but I get all the benefits of being able to help people who really yeah. want help. Yeah. So Robert, I, I think it would be so wonderful if you wouldn't mind to take some time with, uh, with our audience now to explain a little bit more of, of that work as a risk manager and as a broker, when you're working with companies or when you're working with other safety professionals within companies, you know, you already threw out a couple of things. You're helping them project what their mod rating is, their, their experience modification rating, which is going to set the tone on what their premiums are going to be. You know, like you're, you have the ability to really help coach um, safety professionals or company owners on how to reduce cost. And I, and I don't think it's something that all safety professionals know they have access within their brokerage firms. So can you maybe talk about, you know, how you help them and what that means from like even building a business case? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, at M3, we have a, a very robust risk management team. Not all brokers have, um, you know, what we have, a dedicated risk manager to the account, Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the benefit that that provides us is that we're able to, we have a, a data analytics team. So a team that is literally taking your work, work comp losses, um, you know, as, as far back as we want to take them mm -hmm. and doing trending analysis. Um, and that really helps guide me to guide the company. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there's a lot of, of options as far as what we can be used for. Um, but really our bread and butter is you've got a sticky situation, a tough situation, your mods been increasing or whatever it might be. You can't figure out how to guard a machine. Um, that's really where we come alongside and partner with people to come up with innovative solutions, um, you know, based on our experience across the, the industry. So we're mm -hmm. really housed in industries. Um, for the most part, I'm, I'm somewhat of a generalist, mm -hmm. um, but we do get the opportunity to partner with people on those, those tough questions as, as well as, you know, when do I post my OSHA log? Right, right. Yeah. And so you had mentioned data analytics and you're able to do that for, uh, for, for safety professionals. So if you're, if you have a client who's like, gosh, I wish I had some data to show my, um, management structure to maybe, um, move the dial on something to, you know, ask for funding for training or, you know, redoing a process or machine guarding on something. And I need some, I need some statistics. You can do that for them and they just simply need to ask. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And I think, 
you know, both uh, safety professionals and a lot of who I deal with is maybe HR or they don't have a specific safety person. So there's right. multiple hats there. Yeah. Um, but the, the loss run data analysis is, I think, often overlooked in safety as a, a good way to um, provide motivation um, to, to do some of those things you talked about to improve mm -hmm. safety. Um, mm -hmm. To show that, you know, hey, if we can reduce um, slips, uh, trips and falls by, you know, 20 percent or 80 percent or whatever we might do by doing these three things, here's the expected, you know, return on investment that we're going to have. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to articulate that and, and actually show the data analysis, um, I think, is is something that more safety professionals should be aware of. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's one of those things that people kind of miss. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyone listening, um, remember to reach out to your insurance broker if you have one and insurance lines as well um, can provide data analysis um, to, to companies too. And so you do everything as a risk manager from um, what we just talked about with data, but you also go into co companies. You may be providing training. You might be going in to specifically look at a particular instance that someone's having trouble with. Like, I need another set of eyes on this. Um, do you also provide industrial hygiene services too? Yeah. So we have a, a certified industrial hygienist on staff. Um, mm -hmm. We do, I do perform the monitoring and then, um, you know, get it reviewed by that CIH. Yeah. Um, so we do, you know, noise, uh, air sampling. Um, we really do just about anything um, when it comes to industrial hygiene. We also have, you know, force pull meters and, and all sorts of good gadgets to, uh, to kind of give us a better idea of where the problem lies, um, mm -hmm. from a technical perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So talk about, if you don't, if you don't mind it, you know, when we, as safety professionals are always looking for help, we need help because the job is complex. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've often given people advice to go to their insurers, to go to their brokers um, to get this kind of help because there are normally not fees associated with most of it, correct? Because you're already paying a premium? Yeah, that's correct. And it, it depends on the carrier. It depends on, you know, the size of the company and the premium and things like that. But I would say that's a, a, a fair statement that most of the time it's not going to be an additional cost. Yeah. Yeah. I know that um, in the last job I had in safety, I needed some industrial hygiene monitoring done, specifically uh, a study on hexavalent chromium in a welding area. And I'm not an IH and I don't have the equipment. And so I reached out to my insurance broker who was able to provide that service. And I know there was a nominal fee associated with it, but it was much less than going uh, and trying to find my own IH to, to do it. And so it was something that was I, I could easily convince the management structure to to do, <laughs> yeah, and then <laughs> and work with my broker, yeah, yeah, and then you've got a partner too that is not going to just give you the results and say good luck, um, mm -hmm. or or yes, you need a, a respiratory protection program, good luck. Um, mm -hmm. We really partner from beginning to end to evaluate: do we need to do IH monitoring? Um, does it make sense? If so, what type of monitoring do we need to do? Okay, here are the results. Here are some things that I would recommend that you do. Here are some costs associated with that. And so really, you know, from start to finish, um, you may not know that you have an issue, but we're going we're gonna to take you step by step, show you that there is or isn't an issue, show you what you need to do about it, and then help you implement that. So I yeah. think that's the benefit of using a broker. Um, you know, mm -hmm. just the experience across, you know, 75 or 100 companies that we work with each um, can really mm -hmm. give us some good ideas uh, that maybe most people aren't using or thinking of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the insurance world and in the insurance broker world, I know that you have specific frequencies that you're going to reach out to a company um, to offer assistance. But if it's a safety professional listening now, um, and they want to reach the other direction and reach toward you, do you have a recommended um, frequency that, you know, to provide help with them? Is there is there a limit or is there a recommendation? There, I would say that there's um, not really a limit, at least from M3's perspective, we're really um, trying to partner with clients. Um, we really want to make them better and, and be a good partner in all aspects. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't, we don't have a limit per se. Um, I think recommended 
we, we like to touch base quarterly and it really yeah. depends on the frequency of, of claims. If we don't have, um, you know, only a handful of claims, it probably doesn't make sense to touch base that often. But, um, you know, we typically recommend at least quarterly claim reviews and then annually we go over the big picture to say, okay, here's, here's last year in a nutshell. Um, what do we need to be paying attention to? Right, right, right. Well, this this is good information, and I, I, my intention wasn't to make it into an insurance show. Um, <laughs> however, I think it's really important that safety professionals, anyone who's um, working in workplace safety, knows that this is really a, a, a viable and important resource in uh, with risk managers and loss control people in the insurance world to be another helping hand. Um, because let's face it, we all need, (laughs) we all need a little bit of help every once in a while and sometimes more than others, depending on what we're doing and what we're challenged with. Yeah. And even, even, um, you know, very high functioning safety professionals, it never hurts to get another set of eyes on things. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So Robert, tell us about, um, you, you were saying what a great benefit it was for you to, um, have Dr. Lusheen as a mentor and some of the organizations um, that you were introduced to. Um, tell us about what what's that like for you now in this phase of your career? Are you still part of organizations? Are you still seeking out mentors? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that um, I'll probably do the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, active in the Wisconsin Safety Council, the ASSP used to be ASSE. Mm-hmm. Um, on a risk management committee for that Wisconsin Safety Council and, and often um, partner M3 partners with OSHA on a lot of things and um, doing construction breakfasts and things like that. So I'm always um, trying to meet new people and learn new things, I guess I would phrase it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's never been something that's been negative to me. Um, you could say, you know, a little bit of nervousness going in to present in front of 300 people, right? But right. ultimately, it's never been something that's been detrimental to me. So I think, you know, it's if it's always positive, I'm going to keep doing it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. That's and right. I, th- I think it's important that people do that throughout their career, and, and especially starting early in school like we had previously talked. Um, but I I think anybody that gets into a box and isn't looking outside um, of that box is is not going to do well. Um, as things change, you're not aware of them. Mm-hmm. Um, as new ideas come out, um, you're not a part of them. Um, those types of things um, can really be detrimental to a, a safety person's career. Yeah. Um, the dreaded getting stuck in the safety coordinator role for, for 10 to 15 years, you know, mm-hmm. um, that's you really circumvent that by getting out there, meeting people. Um, you'll improve your knowledge and, and potentially your career. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so when you get stumped, as we all do, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, right, because <laughs> we never know at all. What are what are your um, resources? Where do you usually go for help? Yeah, that's that's an awesome question. Um, and and I would say, you know, nobody knows everything. Um, to try and remember the 1910, um, every, every line in there, you're going to have a hard time with it. Um, Mm -hmm. so, you know, typically my first reach out is, and and it depends on where, where we're going with it. If it's an OSHA question, obviously I'm going to go to the CFR and and try and find an answer in there. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got some great mentors at M3, um, that, you know, have been in the industry for a long time and have a lot of knowledge. So that's another resource, but Mm -hmm. I think one that, I would encourage employers to use more if if they don't have a broker that they can reach out to is just calling OSHA. Mm-hmm. Um, there's it's something that you know most people are afraid to call OSHA. They think, well, they've got caller ID and now they're going to come visit my site or something like that. Yeah, and they can't do that. <laughs> they can't, and and mm-hmm. it you know they I think at least my experience with the Wisconsin OSHA um, and the local OSHA offices they they just want to help. They're not right. there to penalize you. Um, it's it's really focused on worker health and safety, and mm-hmm. if you're reaching out, um, it's a great resource. They're mm-hmm. they're not going to penalize you for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah. So when it comes to you know that first part of your early working career and all the risks and <laughs> that you experienced and near misses and and some things that were um, harmful to you. How do you think that informs how you do your work 
today. Do you do you sometimes lean back into those times to? Yeah, help? and I would mm-hmm. I would say from the perspective of understanding what it's like to wear foggy safety glasses. Yeah. Um, so that perspective of having been an employee um, on that level, um, mm-hmm. I think gives me a, a different perspective in that, um, you know, if I'm wearing safety glasses that are 50 cents, they're fogging up on me all the time. It's more of a hazard for me to wear them right. than it is, you know, to not wear them at that point. Um, and, and some of the psychology behind why people do what they do um, when they're working hard and they're exhausted and, and those types of things, I think, are very helpful. And I draw on a lot in my career um, mm-hmm. because a lot of my job is not just working with CEO, CFO, safety director, um, HR, but really bridging the gap between employees and those people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that that's a skill that not every safety person has. Um, if you haven't worked in the industry, you really can't understand what those people are going through on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, you can't prescribe um, solutions if you don't know the whole picture. Yeah. Robert, how do you, when you're, when you're on a site, on a work site with someone or in a company with someone um, and you're, and you're with employees, how do you build your credibility with them? I mean, do you often tell your story about where you where you came from and what you've done? How does that look? How does that work for you? Yeah, that's that's actually probably my thirty second elevator speech that I do. Um, you know, depending on the situation, but in trainings um, when I'm talking to employees, that's something that I always start out with: how I got into the industry, that I understand what their job entails. I've been there. I've done that, mm-hmm. um, and. I think it provides, uh, you know, a, a better, better attention um, from employees when I'm talking to them that, mm-hmm. hey, this is just isn't just an insurance guy. Because I've heard that before, right? You know, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're just a fancy insurance guy. You don't know what's going on. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, I think that helps them understand that, you know, I do. And I, I get it. Um, I get it's tough to wear safety glasses when they fog up. I get that you're go home at the end of the day and you are so physically exhausted that you eat dinner and fall asleep on the couch. Yeah. Um, I think that really helps get them to be more open to what I'm saying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, Robert, where do you, you, you're, you're still pretty new in your career. How many, how many years have you been at this now with safety? Um, I think I'm coming up on five years this year, okay. including all, you know, internships and things like that. Yeah, right. So what do you what do you see for our profession um, going forward? Yeah, and I think this is a, a good question that uh, has a lot of answers. But I think the, the biggest things that we're going to start to see is obviously with millennials coming in, what you can get away with um, from a lack of safety, I'll say, is is a lot less. Um, Millennials aren't putting up with, you know, 60, 80 80 hour work weeks. They're not putting up with um, having their stick their hand inside of a cardboard baler without locking it out. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's going to be a big change in the industry. And I think that will lead to um, automation, um, which is going to, you know, provide a whole nother set of of safety problems, right? If we're working on Mm -hmm. computerized equipment and robots and things like that. Um, so we'll see, you know, the need for a PPE program will probably go down quite a bit, um, cause we'll only have a couple employees there, but, um, uh, when we do lockout tag out, there's going to be a lot more involved on that side of it. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. that's, those are two big things that are going to conjoin and really impact not just safety, but really the working world and that, you know, everything that we do every day. Yeah, interesting perspective in that you feel that millennials maybe are more risk intolerant than other generations. Yeah, and I think that goes back to when we first started talking about the the kind of beat your chest, I'm just going to get it done, I'm a tough guy attitude. Yeah. Um, that has been an inhibitor towards safety for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm starting to see that change where 
you know, they don't have to be the toughest guy on the job site. They just want to go home with all their fingers and toes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. It's completely <laughs> noble, normal, and uh, um, appropriate to want to go home with yeah. all of your digits. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at, at the world compared to the United States, that's more commonplace. Um, you know, we're not overworking people. We're not putting them in, in dangerous situations. And then you come back to the United States and it's kind of that, still that wild west of hmm. um, we're trying to move towards safety, but there's still a lot of people that are behind on it. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting perspective. So maybe as we round out our, our time today, as someone who, you know, was in the trades and decided to go to school for safety, um, anything you'd say to someone who's maybe needing to make a change in, in the trades and someone in their world is going to share this podcast with them? Yeah, absolutely. I would say um, just start exploring. So, you know, go to an OSHA construction breakfast, go talk to your insurance broker about what their, that risk managers or loss control person's job is like, see if you can job shadow. Um, I frequently do that with students where they'll just come out and see what a day would be like. Hmm. Um, I don't, I don't think that you can go anywhere, um, in life without exploring your options. I think if you, um, think that you're in a, in a box and you can't get out, um, and you just continue to do your work inside of that box, um, you're never going to progress. So I think the only way you do that is by exploring, um, getting experiences. Um, uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's really the best option. Mm -hmm. Learning into the, leaning into those mentors and finding them, asking yeah. for help. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, Robert, this has been such a, such a joy to have you on today. And I also wanted to give a shout out to University of Whitewater uh, for producing so many great uh, safety professionals, including yourself and the mentorship you receive from our friend, Dr. Lusheen. Always appreciate that too. Yeah, they, they do a great job over there. Yeah, and they continue it, to improve. Yeah. And thanks for explaining the insurance world um, to our guests today. And so people can remember that that's really a resource um, for us to help us do our jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to provide some light on that subject. Yeah. Thanks so much, Robert. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you all so much for joining in and listening today. And thank you for the work that you all do to make sure your workers, including your temporary workers, make it home safe every day. You can listen to all of our episodes at vividlearningsystems.com or subscribe in the podcast player of your choosing. If you have a suggestion for a guest, including if it's you, please contact me at social at vividlearningsystems.com. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>